Well, <clears throat> we're discussing Understanding Creation. It's a book edited by James Gibson and Humberto Rossi. And it has 20 chapters which are uh, given as questions and then of course um, the answer as best we can give it. And they're intended to be standalone, although obviously there are some overlap at times. They were originally intended to be 1,800 to 2,400 words. I think we're pushing the 2,400 mark in this particular chapter. This uh, week we're going to be talking about how reliable is radiometric dating. It's by Clyde Webster. For those of you who don't know, Clyde Webster completed a chemistry major at Walla Walla College then got his Ph.D. in physical inorganic chemistry at Colorado State. Um, I believe that's in Boulder, if I remember correctly. He um, served as chair of the chemistry department at Loma Linda University, Riverside. For those of you who don't recognize that, that is the La Sierra campus before Loma Linda uh, University split. And also at Walla Walla College prior to joining the Geoscience Research Institute in 1983. He's published several articles and has traveled worldwide, participating in numerous seminars on faith and science until 2000, when due to health concerns, he retired from full-time employment. He still is a vi visiting professor at the University of California, Riverside, and a research professor at La Sierra University. And we've had him here a couple of times, including he made a, what I consider a very good presentation on roll front uranium deposits. Uh, <coughs> Webster has, in some ways, the toughest chapter to write, with the possible exception of chapter 8, uh, which is When Did Creation Occur, which, of course, deals with the same general area. He starts out by saying uh, the conflict between standard radiometric dating and uh, chronology implied by scripture is there. And then he goes on to give scientific details of radiometric dating, although it's very brief and uh, not in-depth. Um, he discusses in more detail the biblical data, suggesting um, an old earth, young life scenario, and discusses difficulties with radiometric dating, basically uh, trying to make, uh, I think, reasonable doubt as to whether uh, uh, radiometric dating is completely um, trustworthy. And then finally, in a summary, he will opt for faith as the highest priority, while urging us to be humble about our knowledge of the problem. Um, he begins, the question of how much time is involved for the history of Earth is one of the most contentious issues in the discussions of creation and evolution. Two sources of information about the past history, that is time, of our planet and solar system are available. The biblical record suggests a short period of time measured in thousands of years since the creation. The overwhelming majority of scientists maintain that Earth's history involves billions of years during which living organisms somehow arose and then diversified to produce the present flora and fauna. One of the most important arguments for a very ancient world is based on radiometric dating. This chapter will consider the issues a creationist can expect to face when dealing with radiometric dating and the age of the Earth. That's the introduction, then he goes into scientific details. The scientific aspects of time can be represented by three divisions with some overlap. An absolute time scale, relative time scales, and physical and chemical time scales. The dating methods that yield the physical time scale are based on atomic changes that are dependent only on time, with environmental factors such as temperature and pressure expected to have no influence. Not quite true, but until very recently was believed to be very largely true. Um, there was, I think, one experiment where they altered uh, the decay of, if I remember correctly, um, beryllium-10 with 0.7% uh, of the half-life change, which is minuscule in the, in the uh, scale of things. Most chronostratigraphic sequential Earth la age layers time scales are based on ages obtained with physical methods, the most important of which uses radioactive decay. The methods used do not necessarily yield absolute dates because geophysical and geochemical processes, that's, I think that's my typo, complicated the, the model conditions for age determination. 
For example, the radiocarbon time scale has deviations from the absolute time scale, and that's recognized by everyone. Uh, chronostratigraphic ages are given the name of the method, so their limitations can be taken into account. For example, the potassium argon age. In other words, they don't say the age is, or they're not supposed to. Uh, they're supposed to say having a potassium argon age of so-and-so, so that if you know potassium argon well, you can say, well, yeah, but it might be this or that instead. In radioactive decay, certain isotopes kinds of atoms are unstable and disintegrate. An unstable parent atom decays into a stable daughter atom and a subatomic particle that can damage nearby atoms. The decay process occurs at a rate that follows a mathematical formula such as that half of the parent life, pardon me, half of the parent atoms decay into daughter atoms in a fixed period of time known as the half-life. Different unstable isotopes have different half-lives. For example, the half-life of radioactive potassium-40 is about 1.26 billion years. Well, the half-life of uranium-238 is about 4.47 billion years. In contrast, the t time required for a, a half a sample of the text says neodymium-142. Neodymium in fact, neodymium-142 is a stable isotope. It's the parent isotope, samarium-146, to decay is about 100. Uh, the text says 100,000 years here. Elsewhere, it says 100 million, and I looked it up. It is, in fact, 100 million years. Uh, unfortunate typos that are, or errors that crept into the text. Um, for dating purposes, the half-life must be short enough to have produced a measurable amount of daughter isotopes since time zero of the sample being studied. It must also be long enough that a measurable amount of parent isotope is still present. The age of a sample is calculated from the amounts of parent material and daughter using the appropriate mathematical formulas. The birth of modern geochronology was presaged at the end of the 1930s by Neer and Metau who invented the mass spectrometer, an instrument measuring the masses of an atom's isotopes. For the first time, isotope abundances could be measured with sufficient accuracy to distinguish non-radiogenic components from radiogenic components. That is, isotopes that are not a result of radioactive decay could be distinguished from isotopes that are a result of radioactive decay. And incidentally, isotopes that are parent isotopes that undergo radioactive decay could be distinguished from isotopes that are not undergoing radioactive decay at the present. Uh, the potential practical applications of this instrument expanded very rapidly and further developments are still occurring today. And of course it's also used in uh, uh, chemistry, particularly organic chemistry, uh, quite a bit for identification of compounds as well. The reliability of radiometric dating depends on the reliability of assumptions on which it is based. All classical dating methods based on the radioactive decay of natural isotopes with long half-lives, not including carbon-14 dating, use the following uh, model assumptions. Carbon-14 is a special case, of course. Um, known initial conditions. None of the daughter element was present in the mineral or rock at uh, tau zero. Uh, the starting point of the radiometric clock. This, that was one I think that the uh, poor typesetters had trouble with because they have tau and a small o, which I'm, I'm sure is incorrect. Um, or the isotopic composition of the daughter element initially present can be determined reliably. For example, um, and boy, that's... Uh, I think that but doesn't belong there. The isochron equal in time method and is corrected for. That is, you either have to start out with no daughter or you have to start out with a known amount of daughter product because if you don't, if you don't know the original amount of daughter product, then it's sort of like looking in an hourglass and you have no idea when it was turned over because you don't know whether the top part was uh, or the bottom part was empty to begin with. And so you can't really use it to tell time. A closed system, the mineral rock has formed a closed geochemical system 
that is, neither the parent nor the daughter element has been added or removed since time uh, tau zero. And they did the same thing there. Um, and three, constant decay. The decay constant lambda is truly constant and is known with sufficient accuracy. Although radiometric dating has weaknesses, they are well known and samples are carefully collected to avoid problems. Challenging radiometric dating on the basis of the possible unreliability of its assumptions has not been very successful. Individual dates are often shown to be wrong, but the overall pattern of dates has enough consistency that it seems to represent more than mere chance. We cannot rule out the possibility that something may be systematically wrong with the theory and method of radiometric dating, but we have not been able to identify what that might be. And that's probably a fair statement for uh, 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 15 years ago, and, and um, well, it's probably a fair statement for today. Um, biblical constraints, now he turns to the Bible itself. The scriptural aspects of time are seen in Genesis, where general time considerations are first presented. In the beginning, and then a specific timeline for the length of the duration of life is outlined after life has been placed on this planet. Seventh-day Adventists have made the conscious choice to accept creation as revealed in scripture. This choice comes with a time constraint of six literal days for creation and a seventh day added for rest and worship. There is a great difference between one week and 600 million years for the development of life. And uh, might add that it's uh, three billion years according to the current chronology. 600 million is just a complex life. Even if the genealogies around it offer doubled, the time of life on this planet is of the order of thousands or tens of thousands of years, not millions of years. Having made this choice, we look for alternative er interpretations of the chronostratigraphy of the layers of the Earth's crust that contain evidence for life. The question becomes, how do one's time constraints begin to resolve the time issues? One approach may be as follows. Obviously, he's kind of suggesting an approach that he feels comfortable with. One, assume that the creation of the universe and world and the creation of life on this earth are distinct processes occurring at two different times. The first, or primordial creation, occurred in the far distant past, and that's given as Genesis 1, 1 to, and 2, and that was followed by the creation of life on earth within the past thousands, not millions, of years. And that would be Genesis 1, 3 and onward. And uh, the reference, by the way, is Francis Nichol. So it's pretty conventional Adventism. Um, assume that the vast number of fossils within the strata of the Earth was uh, de deposited by a worldwide flood that took place sometime after the creation of life. And that, again, is Nichol. Um, Except that the primary purpose for the lineages given in Genesis was to establish the relationship between God and humans and set the stage for the eventual coming of the Messiah, rather than precisely fixing the date of creation week. And I think what he's arguing for is that, um, uh, that, that the uh, Adventist position does not stand or fall with 6,000 years exactly, or uh, even within the... the hundred years of that, um, that if it was 7,000 or 10,000, that it wouldn't be a major problem. And four, accept the creation week as establishing God as creator in the weekly cycle, firmly fixing the seventh day as a Sabbath and a memorial to our God, the creator. So that's kind of his theological interpretation. An old solar system, so using this approach, we first address the age of inorganic, non-living matter of the Earth and solar system, understanding that the mineral planet might have existed for a long period of time before the creation of life described in Genesis. The fact that we find radioactive isotopes present in the materials from the Earth, Moon, and meteorites strongly suggests that our solar system has a finite age. Potential minimum and maximum ages for its formation may be obtained through an analysis of radioactive isotopes, parent-daughter ratios, and missing radioactive isotopes. For example, uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.47 billion years. 
After seven to ten half-lives, the parent isotope is exhausted and there's too little remaining to be detectable. And of course, un unspoken here is that we've still got, well, it is spoken. Some uranium-238 still exists. So we can conclude that the solar system has a maximum age of about 45 billion years. This further is, uh, figure is further refined by analyzing the U-235 to U-238 ratio. Uh, U-235 has a shorter half-life, which implies a maximum age of about 5 billion years. Using the, the same method of analyzing parent-daughter ratios, focusing on the systems where daughter, that's my typo, I'm sure, um, where daughter isotopes are found and parent isotopes are absent, a minimum age can be determined for the solar system. For example, Samarium-146 with a half-life of about 100 million years, and this is where I know that, there's, uh, that the first one was an error, um, is not found in naturally occurring deposits. However, its stable daughter product, neodymium-142, is found in abundance. This means the solar system must be no younger than about 10 half-lives of, that should be Samarium-146, um, which is about 1 billion years. This process brings us to the interesting conclusion that the radiometric age of the planets, moons, and meteorites of our solar system may range between 1 and 5 billion years. When multiple samples analyzed via multiple isotope techniques agree, they are said to be concordant. Concordant dates cannot eas be easily rejected and often point to physically significant events. The concordance observed between the numerous radiometric age determinations for the formation of our solar system yields an age of 4.56 billion years. Can life on Earth be young? What options are available for interpreting the matter of the solar system in Earth as being old, but, not, but yet life on Earth as being young? One approach is to suggest that the modern stratigraphic age for the ages for the fossil layers are accepted only as a result of a worldview in which there is no time constraint, or more properly, there is a con time constraint f uh, for things to be old. Uh, that's, of course, my editorial comment. Um, this approach goes on to question the reliability of some of the methods and assumptions used in radiometric dating of the Earth's fossil layers. The assumption of constant known decay is probably reliable, and we'll come back to that uh, after we get done, especially with today's technology. However, the other two assumptions recognized by the practitioners of radiometric dating, namely known initial conditions, complete resetting of the clock, and a closed system are not always fulfilled, and he has a reference for that from the standard literature. Following are some possible questions about the methods and assumptions of radiometric dating. One, interpretation. No simple applicable procedures are available for interpreting radiometric uh, dating results. The conditions at the sampling site, the composition, the origin of sample, and the preparation techniques in the laboratory are decisive for the interpretation of the results. In other words, they don't take them straight out without doing some interpretation. Each case must be considered separately and requires a specific model with defined limiting conditions. Often complicated mathematical models must be developed. And that's particularly true for things like argon-argon dating. Model ages. A distinction is made between true, model, apparent, and conventional ages. The word model indicates that the age is derived from material, uh, that's my typo, properties within the framework of a specif a specific set of contextual and geochemical geophysical assumptions and constraints. If these assumptions are fulfilled, the age is called a true model age. If not, apparent model ages are obtained. And they're sometimes known to be at variance with what people believe to be reality. Conventional ages are determined according to international guidelines. These are carbon-14, potassium-argon, rubidium-strontium, and uranium-thorium-lead methods. Conventional ages are considered the most precise of all dates determined by physical methods and can be compared better than others. 
isochron or magma mixing line. Radiometric, dating, uh, radiometric ages are often derived from a set of graph data points that define a straight line called an isochron. The age of the rock is calculated from the slope of this line with steeper lines yielding older ages. However, the linear data points may result from mixing of two different magmas instead of from radioactive decay. Now this, by the way, is a well-known uh, phenomenon. It is often difficult to distinguish an isochron from a mixing line, although various possibilities are available. And uh, some texts, by the way, although not this one, as far as I know, uh, will point out that uh, there is no definitive way of, uh, of separating it because mixing lines can imitate isochrons and vice versa in uh, more ways than one. When more than one isotope method yields the same or nearly the same concordant date, the likelihood of it being a real age increases. Concordance is not uncommon when dealing with the inorganic matter of the earth, but may be less common when calculating the dates of fossil material. Unfortunately, um, there's no uh, uh, specific uh, uh, reference to that. It would be nice if somebody uh, uh, did a survey that, that could give us some, some idea of the uh, reliability of, of uh, or the concordance of various radiometric dates and what percentage of the time it happens. Discordance. Scientists performing more than one calculation of radiometric date on a given sample are not surprised when the resulting ages disagree. There's a famous case in the Grand Canyon that's been exploited by the Institute for Creation uh, Research. This disagreement implies that the sample under study may have experienced more than one age-altering event. Well, that's one uh, interpretation. The other one is that the age isn't reliable. Uh, such events may include solidification, heating, remelting, severe shock, mixing with other materials, and exposure to water or high-energy radiation. There are possibilities. Uh, these events affect or even reset different isotopes in the same sample in different ways. Therefore, discordance may provide useful insight into the chronology of events that the sample has experienced. And again, he has a uh, reference for that in the standard literature. Non-resetting. The radiometric clocks may not be reset to zero when the minerals are transported by erosional or igneous processes. Because erosional and other sedimentary processes rarely reset the clock, and this is particularly true with um, uh, potassium argon dating, radiometric dating is rarely used to date sedimentary rocks such as sandstones, shales, and limestones. However, granitic, volcanic, and metamorphic rocks that have undergone igneous processes are often used for radiometric dating. This option suggests that the radiometric ages assigned to the inorganic minerals associated with the fossil are more a reflection of the characteristics of the source material than an indication of the age of the fossil. The non-reset problems for radiometric ages are not hidden, nor are they ignored within the scientific community, although they're certainly not trumpeted to outsiders. For uh, many illustrations are found in the scientific literature documenting such problems. Contamination. Contamination is another problem that arises when dealing with radiometric age determinations. The extent to which contamination affects the various methods can differ greatly. For example, uranium thorium dates on stalactites or stalagmites may be too large by many thousands of years without any indication that such error exists. And this is, by the way, people who believe that they're, say, thousands of years old and the date actually is three or four times that old. Um, so it raises the question as to whether the, um, the uh, date that they're assuming is really the lowest date, that, that it might be lower than that. The cause can be clay that contains traces of, that should be thorium-230. I, th I think that was a simple typo in the book. Uh, or the leaching of uranium. And again, he has a uh, uh, reference in the standard literature. Other 
Deviations occur as a result of other processes as well. Such processes can be geochemical or geophysical, for example, di diagenetic mobilization, complex process that changes newly deposited sediments into rock, a parent or daughter nuclides in a mineral or rock systems. That means that you're adding or subtracting, um, let's say, uranium-234 uh, or thorium-230, which is one of the dating methods that's uh, used, and because you're adding more parent or more daughter, the simple uh, uh, predictions that you would get from, uh, uh, from doing a, uh, uh, the standard mathematical analysis won't hold because your assumptions aren't, aren't true. The occurrence or annealing of, uh, of radiation damage, and that's a problem. Isotope fractionation unequal distribution of isotopes, um, or long-term fluctuations in the production of cosmogenic radionuclides, radioactive elements such as carbon-14 that are continually produced in the Earth's upper atmosphere. And now he concludes this only two paragraphs, so we're almost done with his part. Time is real only because man is finite. However, all aspects of mankind's interpretation of time may not be real. Therefore, we should exercise caution whenever attempting to enforce a rigid interpretation of a prehistoric phenomenon, irrespective of the data, be it science or scripture. The biblical record does not address the age questions directly. <coughs> the biggest difficulty for the scriptural interpretation of the age of the Earth is the progressive radiometric ages found within the geologic column. Uh, there does not seem to be any direct linear relationship between the radiometric time observed throughout the geologic column and the lineages of scripture. Given this difficulty and the significance of faith in the scriptural account, we would do well to recognize the limitations of our knowledge, maintaining our faith as the highest priority while humbly acknowledging the tension that remains between our understanding of the Bible and our understanding of science. We must remember, however, that an old age for the physical earth does not directly imply an old age for life. And that's his, um, his, uh, his article. I, my own uh, view of this is that Webster has a very tough assignment and it's made tougher because of space limitations. Um, when I wrote a book and I tried to devote a part of a chapter to this subject, it wound up <coughs> taking up a third of the book, making it three times larger than any other chapter. Uh, and I was writing as compactly as I thought I could. Uh, he does close to the best job possible for about 15 years ago and a very good one for about seven years ago, but I think that there are some new data that have come out and I think that the approach now can be significantly improved. The basic approach is to point out, that, that Webster takes, is to point out the biblical data and call attention to problems with radiometric dating. That's what all those seven different things were while noting that the problems mentioned are not enough to destroy the various methods at the present time. And uh, I, I think that I would, if I were writing this chapter, I would uh, try to point out that some radiometric dating methods actually point to, I'm sorry, that should read short age. <laughs> And it would also help to point out that significant evidence for short age from non-radiometric age indicators exists as well. Um, pointing out that, uh, that, that there are other indicators that go in, in the other direction, I think, uh, are important if you're going to question uh, the validity of long ages for radiometric dating. Now, some of the radiometric dating methods that point to a short age that I think that can be pointed out now, one of them is carbon dating uh, of carbon-14 dating of fossil carbon. As many of you know, um, I've been involved in some of that. And uh, I've uh, uh, been able to document uh, and uh, 
urge experiments which further documented the presence of carbon-14 in material that under ordinary circumstances would not be expected to have any because it should have all decayed away by now. And uh, uh, I think that the, that data should be at least mentioned at the present time. I, I think that beryllium-10 dating is a failed dating method, and the reason it's failed dating method is because at least some of the implications of it strongly point towards short age. And of course, uh, that means that there must be something wrong with the dating method, and so they don't use it anymore. But that doesn't mean the data is wrong. That just means they don't know how to interpret it. Uh, uranium lead dating, in particular, I'm thinking of Gentry's uh, article in Science in 1976, which, uh, in my opinion, is a classic. And of course, it's in the peer-reviewed literature, so uh, no, you really can't fault it. Um, fish and track dating of tektites, there's a fascinating article in the uh, Earth and Planetary Science uh, letters about uh, fish and tracks and tektites, and uh, most of them are 1 to 2 percent of the fish and tracks that they were expecting for the age. Um, though it's referenced in uh, my book, Scientific Theology. Uranium-helium dating, I think, has just now come out. Uh, first, there were hints in the old literature that uh, the dates they were getting were too low. Um, but uh, the, the uh, material that's come out of uh, the rate book, uh, particularly, I think is, argues fairly strongly for short age. And I think it needs to be paid attention to. There are non-radiometric age indicators uh, that point towards uh, shorter ages. And Erosion rates uh, and paraconformities, I think we've heard plenty about that in this class. Um, thanks, Ariel. And uh, soft sediment deformation, which is the same kind of thing, where you have layers that are supposed to be millions of years apart intermingling with each other as if they're still soft, and it's difficult to visualize that. Uh, amino acid racemization is a very strong indicator for short age, and uh, probably should be mentioned. Uh, that's, of course, not the interpretation of, uh, of uh, Ed Hare, uh, rest his soul, but uh, it is, uh, the data is still there, and it's uh, pretty powerful stuff. And if there's fresh biological material in fossils, um, uh, the Schweitzer and uh, related uh, researchers, and um, there's the question of genetic deterioration. All of these things point towards a short age. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that radiometric dating is not the only game in town. Um, it was, I think, at one time reasonable to be skeptical of the possibility of change in the rate of radiometric decay. Uh, but we now have evidence of a change in the decay rate, which is currently unexplained by standard atomic theory. Uh, in fact, we have a couple of evidences, uh, one of them having to do with solar cycles, um, exactly why, we're not sure, and one of them uh, having to do with solar flares and a decrease in radioactive uh, decay. And we don't understand which, uh, how those work. But uh, it does say that we have to be careful about ruling out the possibility of a, a major change in, uh, in radioactive decay. And we also have evidence of the lack of expected helium diffusion in zircons, with the actual diffusion matching a creationist time scale quite well, and arguing that uh, the decay that's happened in the zircons happened uh, something of the order of uh, 6,000 years ago, um, plus or minus about 2,000. I think that's significant, and I think that it does argue that we at least need to consider the possibility of a rapid decay rate. Uh, I think that, uh, to summarize that, a change in the, the rate is really a live possibility. We'll have to keep it in mind. And finally, I think it would help if the chapter to suggest further research projects. 
because I think that this is not necessarily a static situation, and I think that, uh, for example, I think that it would be fascinating for somebody to do fish and track dating on petrified wood. Coming after the flood, if there has been accelerated dating, you would be past that. Uh, if there's not been accelerated uh, dating, uh, decay, uh, then fish and tracks in petrified wood might be ex uh, expected to be uh, quite a bit lower than, you'd, than you would expect from the standard dating method. To my knowledge, it's not been done. Uh, I'd like to see it done. Um, I actually have a sample that I'm trying to find somebody to do, uh, if, if it can be done. Uh, there's uh, Phanerozoic meteorites that have intermediate uh, 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 decay isotopes, beryllium-10, carbon-14, sodium-22, aluminum-26, chlorine-36, uh, man manganese-53, and uh, 129 iodine, which would be all fascinating to do. Nobody's done them because the people who uh, run the labs are not really that interested. They, they know that they shouldn't be able to find any of that stuff, and so they're not going to do the dates. Uh, Whereas for somebody with our persuasion, uh, it might be interesting to see whether those uh, elements are still there. Uh, uranium thorium dating on Paleozoic coral, there are some specific uh, predictions that one can make using certain kinds of uh, decay, um, uh, uh, certain kinds of, uh, of models to explain uh, the, the dating of present corals. And they have implications for Paleozoic coral, and it would be interesting to test those implications. And somebody should sometime do some a study of unfiltered data, that is to say, you know, chronologically sequential stuff, looking at all of the ones and see what percentage of them, in fact, uh, don't match. Is it 50%? Is it 80%? Is it 20%? Is it 5%? I think that that's an important uh, uh, question to ask, and I don't know that anybody has asked it because, again, uh, most people aren't that interested in it. And uh, a final thing that would be interesting, interesting is that most of the time the explanation for argon dates that are too young, and there are a number of them, is that argon diffuses out too fast. And it would be interesting to do diffusion rates of argon actually measured in the laboratory, somewhat like they were measured for helium, uh, to see whether that is a reasonable explanation for low uh, potassium argon dates. Uh, in fact, there is some preliminary evidence in the literature that, uh, that uh, the diffusion rates are actually too slow to account for uh, uh, those two young dates. And finally, I think it would be important for us to extend the observation regarding helium diffusion. Is it only at the one um, core um, in New Mexico, or are there a number of other places that uh, have the same phenomenon? And I think that it's important for us to, because there's some argument that this particular helium is, has been gotten in from uh, a volcano that's about 20 miles away, it would be fascinating to do helium-3 measurements of that volcano's helium and helium-3 measurements of the helium that's in the, uh, in the zircons in uh, the cores and see whether they match or whether, in fact, there is very low helium-3 in, uh, uh, in the cores, which would imply that it's mostly radioactive dating and not coming from the volcano in that case. Um, you know, uh, it's nice for us to believe that it's one thing and for them to believe it's another, but I think that it's important for us to do, whenever we can, testing to see whether there is some way of telling the difference between what we believe and what they believe. And with that, I'm going to leave it open to you guys to uh, make comments or ask questions. And we have one in the back.
pass that around if anybody needs it. Yes. Um, do you have a reference for that statement you made about possible changes in the decay rate having to do with solar flares? Uh, I don't have it on me, but I, I do have the reference. And uh, uh, if you want to give me your email address after class, I'll be happy to, to email it to you. Uh, it's it's actually available online. You know the online uh, journals are really coming in now, and it uh, uh, it makes it a lot easier for those of us who don't have all the money in the world to to uh, access the articles. And uh, uh, so yes, I do have a reference for that. Uh, Fishman and uh, can't remember the other guy's name begins with. <coughs> Anyway, so yes. Um, I think so, although it's been a while since I looked at it. Uh, it is. I think he was from Stanford. Uh, one of, one of them was from Purdue, I think. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's. It's very controversial because, of course, it goes against everything that everybody's been t trained uh, that you basically can't alter, uh, you know. And here, it, it suddenly the uh, decay rate for manganese 53, I believe it is, dropped significantly uh, just before a solar flare. Hmm. And nobody has, uh, you know, it's before the flare, so it's hard to attribute it to the flare particles. But, uh, and maybe it's just before a solar flare, and that's a total coincidence. Um, so we haven't observed it since. So uh, nobody really knows for sure exactly where that's going. But uh, that it dropped is a pretty obvious physical finding. And actually, that it dropped before the solar flare is even more convincing because if it had dropped during the solar flare, you'd say maybe the solar flare was interfering with the um, measurements or something. Uh, but it's not true anymore. Uh, uh, we have a comment here, and then one up there, and then one here. And uh, Go ahead. This is a fascinating subject, even to lay people, but uh, very complex, as you know. And so I appreciate uh, being able to cover it here and discuss it. Um, sometimes we have these experiments that seem to challenge conventional thought, but they're not repeatable. I'm thinking about cold f fusion that really hit the headlines back 20 years ago or so, and that uh, they weren't able to replicate. It would have been great. More recent example is um, something that seem to defy uh, Einstein on the speed of light being the fastest thing. And you know, neutrinos were thought to be a little faster than the speed of light. Just this week, they came out with a preliminary report of what actually may have gone wrong. One is just a simple wiring problem in the equipment. And then there was uh, one other thing that I read this week that um, it, it's there's a little gap between Timing. It's a timing yeah. gap, and it's so small that there's a little room for error there. So mm -hmm. they're they're wanting to repeat the experiment, and they're still going to try and find well, something I think faster they than speed yeah. of light. I think they should. Uh, uh, I, I think that well, this is the kind of thing that is normally fascinating, um, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, for example, one, the, the one that, where the annual is very convincing, the data are very convincing that something is going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, people have tried to say, well, maybe it's, the, it's hotter in the summer, colder in the winter, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's an uh, air-conditioned and heated building, so that makes it a little harder to make that case really <laughs> well. Uh, maybe the voltage varies over the year or something. Uh, nobody's really come up with a, a good explanation of what is going on there. And interestingly enough, other people have repeated this with other isotopes and not come out with the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it is two completely separate laboratories, mm -hmm. and they were collecting the data without paying attention to what was happening. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they deliberately biased it. Uh, so I think you have to... 
you have to say at least there's room for a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. Now, while I have the mic, I have a couple questions, or I can save them till later. Uh, if you go ahead, and then we'll move it, uh, the mic on afterwards. Okay. Um, the two questions have to do with non-radiometric quote stating methods uh, advocated by certain creationists. One is the decay of the Earth's magnetic field, which would be a non-radiometric method which dates the Earth to 10,000 years or less. The other is the uh, change in the speed of light, as you know, decay in the speed of light, and that also uh, gives you an age of the Earth of about 10,000 years. Um, are we correct in calling these dating methods, or are they extrapolations of data? And secondly, do we do we need to even discuss them? Are they so far out that we don't need to even pay attention to them? Well, I, I think that uh, in the case of um, the Earth's magnetic field, that you have to be really careful with that data because the, that is assuming that you have straight decay. And nobody, but nobody that I know of, actually believes that, including the creationists who have used it sometimes. That most people say that in the geologic column, and therefore from a creationist point of view, during the, the Genesis Flood, uh, that there have been rather sharp swings in the, uh, in the uh, geomagnetic field, all the way from positive to negative. So you know that extrapolating it out to infinity breaks down at the flood. And so I'm, I'm a little cautious about using that as a strong argument. Um, we don't really understand what causes the magnetic field. And uh, we're not likely to be able to test various hypotheses as it would require setting up different Earths and imparting different movements to their magnetic interior. And I, that's a, an experiment that's probably beyond human technology for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so I, I don't tend to use that one. Um, I think there are some interesting things. One of them is that, uh, uh, that if you project the moon's motions backwards, because, uh, because of what happens with the tides, as you get closer, they get higher, and their, their uh, strength and their ability to speed up the, the moon's orbit gets higher, that uh, you wind up with the moon, um, uh, as you go backwards, crashing into the Earth in about uh, uh, one billion years, which, of course, is not in the standard time frame. Um, and uh, I, I think that that's an interesting thing. I, of course, if you, were, if you were to argue the opposite, what you'd probably say is, well, asteroid came and uh, reworked the moon so that, that uh, it actually separated about four and a half billion years, which is what the conventional mm -hmm. wisdom would be. And so what you're seeing is not, uh, is not what you had before. Uh, it puts some strain on the theory, but I don't think that it's enough to where it's... Uh, I don't think it's the same quality as seeing layers that are separated by millions of years with, you know, columns pushed up from the lower layer, which is obviously still liquid enough to be pushed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to me, I look at that and I say, those had to be done, this had to be soft at the same time. and. Uh, the speed of light, the theory has fluctuated enough that I'm not quite sure where one goes with it. Um, it's interesting, but it hasn't made enough positive predictions yet that I'm comfortable, um, you know, uh, just using it as a straight extrapolation. Um, if we start being able to nail that this uh, isotope decayed at such and such a rate at such and such a time, and we can show that's the case, um, then I think we're on a little firmer ground, but we're not, I don't think we're there yet. 
uh, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't bring it up, even though it may be in the future that it's a very powerful argument. Um, my understanding is that it's not a straight decay now, that there's actually been documented that, that the speed of light has risen slightly, in, at least the measurement of the speed of light has risen mm -hmm. in the past um, few decades. And so, uh, you know, now that you're not dealing with a uh, simple exponential decay, projecting it out as an exponential decay has some uh, difficulties. So I, I probably wouldn't use that as a major argument. Uh, let's see, I think we had here and then Ariel Roth. <coughs> a few years ago, there were some articles published in the, in the conventional literature that I'm not qualified to evaluate, but they were interesting. And that is that the laboratory measurements of decay rates of these major methods uh, vary according to the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Now, the, dis the difference isn't great because the distance from the Earth to the Sun doesn't change very much. It's about 0.3% or something like but that. But it implies that something external is, is affecting this. I, I asked a friend about this who's a nuclear physicist, and he said, oh, physicists have always known that's true. So <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, now, that's fascinating because most of the physicists I've talked to did not know that was true. Certainly, it's not made it into the textbooks. Mm -hmm. The conventional <laughs> wisdom is that it does not happen. Um, uh, if if physicists have known this to be true and have kept quiet about it, that's, that says something about uh, the power of the paradigm, I think. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, I know the data is out there, and I know there's data to contradict it, and the interesting thing of it is that some of the data is actually a ratio of two isotopes which implies either that one's doing it mm -hmm. and the other one's not, or the other one's doing it in reverse, or uh, they're both doing it halfway, or maybe they're both doing it, but one is just more than the other one. Um, uh, and, and I've asked people about that, and uh, uh, in fact, I think I emailed Fishback and asked him about it, and he said, uh, we're looking at that. So I, ex I expect that we're going to see more absolute time scale stuff pretty soon rather than the relative one uh, that, uh, that, that one of those experiments is depending on. Now the other one, I, I guess the radium-224 variation is supposedly on an absolute basis. And I'm sure that somebody's going to take that isotope again and measure it over three or four years and publish the data. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be quite fascinating to see how this all uh, comes out. But what it does suggest is that, that uh, radiometric uh, or radioactive decay rates are not set in stone, uh, or at least they may not be, in which case we need to be really careful about arguing that, uh, as one of my uh, compatriots once argued, that uh, if the decay rates change, the universe would fall apart. Uh, it, it appears that the universe is not falling apart, and yet it appears that decay rates do, in fact, change. Um, Ariel? Yeah, it uh, <coughs> extremely interesting presentation. I like uh, Clyde's approach. Uh, however, I would say what the student or novice is faced with hundreds of thousands of dates in the scientific literature that seem to agree to a certain extent with uh, the general geological column dating. Uh, they're out there and uh, uh, we can propose these exceptions and I, I'd just like to suggest a uh, fact that maybe there are some factors that are responsible for this. Uh, we need to keep, keep in mind the radiometric time scale was largely established with potassium argon dating. And uh, once that became established, of course, it became uh, the influence on whether dates were correct or not, and which method would be correct or not, and so on. And some of these other factors come into, into play. But uh, considering there are so many of those dates that do agree, uh, 
is it possible that there are certain factors that affected this, and that's basically during the Genesis flood, that might have affected the, these these various dates? And I, I want to mention two, two possibilities here. One is the uh, a paper by Damon and Culp, where they analyzed a large number of minerals. I, I don't have the number offhand. I, I think we're talking about 20 or 30 or 40 uh, samples. Uh, for excess argon and excess helium. Yes, beryl and cordiate to, to be specific. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about that article was uh, tr these are all anomalous dates, you understand? There were some anomalous dates. Beryl and cordite don't have any potassium in yeah, them, so true. where the argon came from is totally, uh, it must have been the surroundings or something because they don't have potassium-40 to produce right, the argon-40. Right, 40. right, and, and in some of these samples, they found a thousand times as much argon in the sample as it would be expected if that sample were over a billion years old. I mean, this is a lot of excess argon, uh, and they found the helium there. Now, but the crux of the article is that they, they grouped these uh, various samples into three categories according to uh, their general position in the geologic column, and they found that the excess was much greater lower down than uh, in the middle, which was much greater than what was at the top. Now, what are we talking here about? We're talking about a systematic error of excess argon and excess helium, which are used in, in these dating methods. Particularly uh, argon. Hel helium dating is pretty much given up because uh, it keeps uh, giving two young dates. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, helium diffusion, let, let me get to helium diffusion first. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, so you've got uh, a system here which might produce these older dates here. As a result, uh, they attributed in part to uh, uh, probably a degassing of the mantle at some time in the past. Uh, was a lot of helium uh, accumulates down in the mantle and so on, and then it goes up. Uh, it gets less, uh, I guess, and they think it came from there due to some accidents and so on, but uh, uh, we, have this, we have this gradient to talk about. Uh, the second paper I want to talk about is one by uh, Dalrymple and Moore, uh, and this deals with, uh, this is published in Science, I think, yeah, uh, with uh, checking dates on lava flows in Hawaii, where you had uh, deeper dates, I mean dates, older dates, as you went deeper along these lava flows. Now, these lava flows were recent. These are recent, uh, it was just one lava flow actually, uh, off of the main island of Hawaii. And uh, the interesting thing is, by, by carbon-14 dating and pelagonite uh, weathering and so on, they, they should, they thought that lava flow was less than 15,000 years old. But they did get uh, potassium argon dates out of it. And the interesting thing is that further down they went in this recent lava flow, the older the potassium argon dates got up to 43 million years. Uh, they suggested as one factor that might cause this is hydrostatic pressure. Now, uh, not allowing the argon to get out of the... Not uh, allowing the argon. The higher the pressure, the less argon escape. That's why the deeper uh, samples... And there's always this problem of excess argon and, and plasma argon dating, you know. Uh, and less of the excess argon escaped at the higher pressures, which are deeper. And the more argon you have, the older the date. And so, again, you've got a systematic error here, we might say, if you want to call it... Uh, a systematic system that produces a uh, gradual increase in dates as you go deeper down. Uh, and uh, water pressure and so on, that's very interesting when you're thinking about the flood. 
so you've got this, uh, this uh, something that you looked at here in connection with this, but uh, I realize that this helium thing is in contrast to this Yemez uh, uh, caldera thing that you mentioned, uh, which goes the other opposite direction. Uh, there's no question in my mind that something happened in Yemez caldera about 6,000 years ago, uh, around there, from that helium diffusion stuff. Uh, no question about that, uh, but uh, they only have about a dozen samples, and so on. I think it's a local situation, obviously local. Yeah. I, I wonder if, uh, you know, both for now it could be correct, but uh, the more general one might be uh, Damon and Culp's uh, data that, hey, uh, there can be some factors here that produce all these dates, at least established, uh, the, the basic dating system. This is only a suggestion. You know, we, we don't have all the answers, but uh, something to be looked at. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, I'll point out now that it's uh, after uh, 11.30, and I know that some of you have places that you need to be, but uh, um, <laughs> we'll continue the discussion for a little bit longer for those of you who want to stay. Um, can you pass the mic back to um, uh, Nick here? Maybe those of you who want to comment may want to come down closer to where uh, uh, it'll be easier to get, uh, uh, to get the discussion going. Okay, I, I want to make a reference to the initial conditions, assumption. Um, when uh, God, did God create a baby Adam, who then later grew into a man? Or did God create a man whose age by a physician would have been estimated at 30 or 40 years old? The same thing about trees. Did, those, did, God, crea did God create the seeds for a tree, for an oak? Or did God create the actual trees? So, the Bible sets the initial condition not at zero. And this could apply. Could this apply also to what we are talking about today? In other words, could God have decided that it was convenient to have something that did not start at zero. And then some, uh, another observation about the speed of light. If, if the universe is subjected to the speed of light, then there's no way there's going to be any communication possible after Jesus comes back between planets. Because if I want to find out something about the distant the inhabitants of a distant solar system somewhere in the universe, I have to wait billions and trillions of years for a response. It would make sense. This morning, I got up and decided to watch what was taking place in Argentina, the church I grew up in, and I was watching. They were doing their thing, their worship service, and I was watching here at the speed of light. But in a universe as large as it is, I think the speed of light is good for nothing. It's, it's useless. We see in the, in the Bible says that Jesus in the morning told Mary, I have not ascended yet to the Father. This was in the morning. In the evening, he was present with the disciples. So he went and came back the same day. Well, what do we do with the speed of light? Are we, is, is God or are we going to be limited to the speed of light?
the uh, present argument assumed that uh, we are not in a special place in the universe. Um, and we may in fact be. There are a couple of uh, there are a couple of problems that exist um, with trying to say that the speed of light isn't uh, isn't the same in at least our our Milky Way. Uh, beyond the Milky Way, it gets a little more dicey. Direct observations are hard to get. Um, but for example. Uh, there are supernovas that can be looked at, and you, you can see how, what angle of the sky they cover. And uh, you can reasonably uh, say that at least those things that are traveling by most uh, conventional wisdom, perhaps that a third of the speed of light, uh, are the size that one would expect from when they were seen exploding on Earth. That is, a new star came out, now we have a nebula instead, and the nebula covers a certain arc, and it covers the arc that you'd expect if those things were uh, behaving themselves as normally physics would expect. I think we have to be really careful about assuming that the uh, uh, that the speed of light uh, has changed a great deal in the past uh, four thousand, six thousand years. Um, the galaxy is supposed to be a hundred thousand light years across. Uh, it's a problem. I'd love to see a nice, tidy solution. I haven't seen one. What I'd really like to see is not just a nice, tidy solution, but a solution that makes predictions that n normal science doesn't, that can be tested and are found to be true, and the normal science predictions are not. I think when, we can, when our theories are good enough to do that, then we can, with some confidence, enter the scientific ring. Um, I, I, I think in the case of carbon-14 dating, that's precisely what happened, is that uh, predictions were made that, uh, that given certain circumstances, you might be able to find carbon-14 in coal and oil and things like that. Natural gas now, it turns out, has some, there are a number of different things that have been tested and, 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 and they, the amounts we're finding are in the range that you might expect, and they're not in the range that you would expect from a standard theory. When we can make those kinds of predictions and have them stick, I think that that's when our theories start gaining tra traction. Right now, the, the problem with the speed of light is that the theory is not good enough yet to make uh, predictions. And in fact, the initial theory was that it was decaying to zero, or, or to, to the speed that we have now, and it wouldn't change significantly. And now come to find out, in fact, it has increased slightly. So um, what to do with that, I'm not sure. Well, what, uh, what I'm suggesting is that perhaps there is a way of communicating God's universe that is not tied up with the speed of light. That's my, that's my, uh, my suggestion. And uh, see, uh, the I, I'm going to agree with that. I, I suspect that there may be another dimension that, it, that God could be as close to us as he wanted to be and we wouldn't even know it. Uh, and, that, uh, and that perhaps rather than traveling towards Orion or someplace else like that, that what God did, uh, what Jesus did was was basically went into another dimension where he can move to another place much more rapidly and then pop back in whenever he wants to into our into our world uh, while being observant all at the same time and perhaps the reason why angels seem so special to us 
and they may not be any more unnatural organisms than we are. Um, but they can inhabit a different dimension than we can, and so they, they don't have to be there all the time. Um, uh, now, can we prove that? No. Uh, all we can do is suggest it as a possibility. And uh, it may very well be that we're constantly being observed by uh, beings of both good and bad from, from elsewhere, and occasionally interfered with, um, perhaps because it's difficult to step from one to another uh, and that uh, God mercifully keeps most of those people from interfering most of the time. Um, but perhaps the uh, ability to step back and forth uh, is partly related to one's uh, uh, harmony with the rest of the universe or something like that. Um, uh, so that the devil is operating at a disadvantage if that's the case, which would, of course, be frustrating to no end to him, but that's life. Um, but those are all speculative ideas, and they don't, they don't really have consequences that we can sink our teeth into very easily, other than to say that it's easier to believe in, the, uh, in a supernatural if it is, in fact, uh, an understandable one. Uh, rather than simply magic. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that uh, we can prove anything, but this morning I was listening to David Ashrick, and he was, uh, he mentioned the definition, scientific definition of evolution, and he emphasized the word unsupervised. Yes. Now, if we believe in creation, that means we reject that idea of unsupervised. And he used the illustration, he says, trying it, to... It, it depends. I would prefer to say I am unpersuaded by it, right. rather than that I reject it. But That's why he ridiculed the idea of a theistic evolution, which is prevalent, uh, <laughs> not in this well, room, the, but... Uh, there are, in fact, two different brands of theistic evolution. There is the old one, in which God supervised this process. And then there is a newer one in which God basically turned this process loose and didn't mess with it after that. Although God is always there, so it's kind of interesting uh, a God who is there but not there at the same time. And it, that one has a certain amount of philosophical incongruity to it. But the advantage of that one is that it never challenges the observations of the uh, uh, standard scientific community and therefore uh, is completely safe from, uh, well, uh, not quite, but it is much safer from the people who are arguing uh, that there, there is no God because it says, well, there's no evidence, but there's God anyway. And they're pretty much willing to let you have that, that uh, niche if that's where you want to go. Well, I still believe that, uh, that trying to harmonize, harmonize creation with evolution makes no sense for me, at least. In the, David Ashrick used the, the illustration of a square in a circle. If you try to harmonize both, you get a squircle. Instead of a square or a circle, you get a squircle, which is a non-comprehensive idea. There's no way to harmonize. The Bible, the, I mean the doctrine presented in the Bible with the creation, with a plan of salvation, with a fall and redemption and everything, there's no way to, to how do you say it? Well, there's, no, there's no way to really square the circle. Yeah. Uh, you, have to, you have to shave off something of one or both theories in order to make it fit. And as long as you insist that, uh, that science has it right, what you uh, basically have is a square that you name a circle, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense. But that's kind of where you, where you have to go. Uh, backing up a bit to um, space travel, 
um, and the speed of light. In the commentary by Ellen White on, I think, 1 Corinthians 15, she said that the same particles that went into the ground when we're buried are not going to be resurrected, that God is going to make us new as a, quote, finer substance, unquote. And that, to me, would be necessary because this body, just resurrected as it is, even if he turns the clock back to age 20, is not going to be able to travel through space. So whatever that finer substance is, whether it takes another dimension or takes the Star trek kind of pods you go into, <laughs> uh, or whether it's just that God is able to reconstitute us here and then there, and that's us, and we don't have to physically travel through space at any uh, particular speed. You mean sort speed. of like the, uh, the uh, uh, Star Trek uh, beam me up Scotty thing? Yes, that kind of <laughs> Or Or the, just that God it gives us the capacity or does it for us to where we can just go from one place to another without having to physically go because our essence, our atoms, whatever it is, that is this finer substance, is, can be reconstituted, and it's us here, and then it's us there. Yeah. You know. Well, basically, as a, you know, physically, we don't have any of the atoms uh, left, or you know, a few thousand chance ones that, that that happen to recycle, but we basically don't have any atoms left from seven years ago. So it's not the individual atoms that counts; it's the arrangement. And, of course, that raises the question, well, could God create two of us and then live two different lives? Well, yeah, he could. I, I guess that's one of those things that you'll just have to trust God not to do. It couldn't be you. <laughs> that's your twin, not, not you. Well, I, I, but, he could, but, you know, God could theoretically do that. It's just I, I don't think he's going to do it. A of me is not me. A, me? Clone, a clone of me would not be me. Um, it's just starting with something yeah, from well, my it, you know, It's an it's interesting philosophical daughter. question. If you have an axe and you replace the head, is it still the same axe? If you then replace the handle, is it the same axe? If you then replace the head again, is it the same axe? You know... Um, <laughs> If you've gone through three handles and, and five heads, is that the same axe? Uh, and, uh, you know, if our thought process is, well, I, the thing of it is, that's happening to our bodies all the time. You drink water precisely because some of it has to go out and you have to replace it. But somehow it gets incorporated into you. Um, the brain cells themselves don't replace. But each individual atom in the brain cells pretty much replaces, except for, I suppose, the DNA. That uh, there's constant reorganization, restructuring. Uh, you know, a new protein will come and the old one will be torn out and, put a, and thrown away. Um, so it's not dependent on a particular atom, as you say, to keep me, me. That's right. And if God, uh, you see, if God beams you up, could he not beam you up in two different places at once? No, there's one of us. <laughs> there's one of me. So I, I think that at a certain point we have to kind of trust what's going on. Anyway, uh, next week I think we'll, uh, we'll discuss um, the ethics of journalism and uh, the ethics of uh, research for creationists, evolutionists, and global warming experts of various kinds, and it's going to be interesting, I think. Uh, and uh, we will get to the, uh, to the uh, carbon-14 stuff as soon as I can. <laughs>